Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And uh, it's a pleasure to rise to today's motion because it addresses something that I think is uh, an important public policy issue. It's a matter that touches the uh, public interest because I think at the very least we all agree that having an independent and well-resourced uh, media is an important part for any well-functioning democracy, Madam yep. Speaker. And so that's why it has been concerning over the last number of years to see newsrooms closing down and journalists being put out of work uh, because of the revenue challenges in more traditional media. Um, because for as much as news is circulating more than ever on social media, social media is not a content generator. They're not the ones that write the story. So fewer and fewer journalists are writing the stories that are being circulated ever and ever wider. Uh, but that's not necessarily, in fact, it's not. It's not an increase in the amount of quality journalism that's happening. It's just a, a wider audience for the smaller amount of journalism that's happening. So the, uh, the, the lack of funding or the inability of news organizations to, to be able to hire journalists to do proper investigative reporting is a serious problem, and I think it's a public interest problem. That's where I disagree with the member from Thornhill who said on, on a number of occasions that, you know, essentially government should be blind to this problem mm -hmm. or not engage with it or that there isn't any room for some kind of public policy fix. If we simply leave this to the market, what we've seen is that the market is failing to support yep. good journalism. So there, there is a need for a solution there. If the market can provide one, so be it. It's just that we're not seeing that. And we're running out of time yeah. as more and more newsrooms close down and we have less and less people doing the good work that journalists do in Canada. So that's where I think, you know, we're, we're quite agreed in the NEP that something needs to be done. We've been calling for that for a long time. I think part of our frustration is that this is a kind of 11th hour mm -hmm. solution, if you can call it that. It's an 11th hour proposal yep. by the Liberal government to finally kind of start maybe doing something yep. about a problem that's been existing for a long time, that has been allowed to get to a point where it's actually becoming quite serious. And to drop it at the end of the Parliament, I think, is also unfortunate, because I think we see, even just by the nature of, of the debate, and we don't all agree on the various components of this debate, but the fact that there is as much contention about the solution that there is, uh, I think is evidence that we needed a longer timeline if we wanted to try and find some kind of consensus or at least a meeting of the minds between some of the parties in this place. We needed more time to be able to do that. So to have the proposal come out just recently yeah. when the end of the parliament is only a few weeks away really doesn't bode well for finding a solution that as many political actors as possible can sign on to. And that is important, Madam Speaker, because um, I don't think anybody should be uh, naive about the fact, I mean, the NEP has known for a, for a long time, Madam Speaker, that big corporate money yep. has played a role in media. And we've often been on the receiving end of what that means in terms, in terms of editorial opinion, yep. the kinds of stories that, cov get, get, that, that get covered, Fair the right. angles on the stories that get covered. So we know all about, yep. on this side of the House, what money means to media and the frustrations of finding people who are ideologically opposed to your point of view and don't want, you to see, won't want to see you succeed. We've had a lot of people in the media over the years. We're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Winnipeg General Strike this year, Madam Speaker, uh, and we've heard lots of stories of the coalition between business leaders and newspapers mm -hmm. and what they did to demonize strikers, to misrepresent their position, and we've seen that carry on through the last yeah. hundred years too. So there are great journalists doing independent work. There has always been the question of money in media. So I mean, as long as we do have a solution on offer and the government is going to be providing subsidy, the NEP has no objection to workers being at the table. Unifor represents over 12,000 workers in the industry. We know because we're not outside unions looking in, we know that Jerry Diaz can, has, can have his opinions and Unifor as a larger union can have their position when it comes to an election. That doesn't mean that Brad Hunnewill, who's an established retired journalist who worked for the Sun Media chain, which incidentally is not known for giving the Conservatives an unfair hearing. I think anybody here who has read the work of the Sun Media chain will not feel, if they're giving an honest assessment, that the Sun Media chain does not fairly communicate the views of the Conservative movement of Canada. And so that was his career, and he can speak 
on that panel with a sense of independence as a, as a retired journalist. And, uh, and, that's, and that's fine, and that's separate from the political activities of the union. So it may be that there's some understanding, misunderstanding on the Conservatives' part as to how large democratic organizations work, but to have somebody named from Unifor to the panel with a long history and experience in the industry, to be one member of eight who are going to make recommendations about what the rules will be and further nominate a second independent panel is not the end of the world. No. That doesn't mean that this is the best model, Madam Speaker. And with the time that we've had, because this has been coming like a slow train wreck for years and years, as my honorable colleague from uh, Longueuil, uh, Saint-Hubert Saint said uh, very well, and I commend him for all the work that he's done on this over the years. This has been coming for a long time. And uh, as my honorable uh, NEP colleague from, from Saskatoon pointed out earlier, the reason why this is happening is because of a uh, a, a kind of structural issue within the industry that has to do with the fact that this is an industry that heretofore has been funded through ad revenue. The problem is that, adver ad, that ad revenue for traditional media is drying up because it's going to new media. And when businesses spend money on ads, or any advertiser spends money on ads through Facebook or Google or another internet company, <coughs> number one, they're not, they're not charged the same tax that they would be if they were advertising in Canadian media. They're not charged the sales tax, the, 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 the GST, Madam Speaker. So these social media platforms already have a number of inherent advantages in terms of their reach, in terms of being able to target. But on top of that, government policy offers further incentive to advertise with those companies by helping to make it cheaper, by not applying a sales tax. And they also make it cheaper by, uh, by not um, so when you, when you advertise in Canadian publications, print publications, those advertising costs, you can write off your taxable revenue as a, a business. You can't do that if you're advertising in print mm -hmm. in U.S. publications or, or international publications. But when it comes to the Internet, even though Facebook and Google are American-based companies, they're treated as Canadian companies. And so Canadian advertisers are able to get the same tax advantage for advertising with Facebook and Google as they are in, in Canadian print publications. So those are two taxation measures, Madam yeah. Speaker, that incentivize advertising with foreign-based advertisers as opposed to Canadian publications. That is at the root of what's happening in terms of the crisis of revenue that's causing newsrooms to shut down or to lay off journalists and run on a skeleton crew. So what's odd about this proposal is it doesn't really cut to the core of the structural incentives that government policy has created to advertise with non-Canadian advertisers online. So why, why you would come up with a, with a Band-Aid solution when there are clear structural issues, and there's recommendations from a number of different parliamentary committees and other, in, in, uh, other independent uh, groups, Madam Speaker, that, that name that problem, why the Liberal government wouldn't be concerned to address the structural issue rather than just trying to slap a Band-Aid on top of it mm -hmm. is anybody's guess. Now, I've been around here not as long as some, Madam Speaker, but it's coming up on four years. And what I have seen when it comes to pharmacare, for instance, is that there are clear proposals for how to move forward, yeah. expand coverage for Canadians, and cool. save billions of dollars every year, and they're not prepared to do it. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because that would hurt the corporate profits of their buddies, mm -hmm. Madam Speaker. When we look at climate change and some of the very real things that need to happen in order to be able to effectively combat climate change from the Canadian perspective, we run up against their desire to protect the profits of the oil and gas uh, industry, Madam Speaker. And so they continue to offer subsidies. They, they bought an old pipeline, not build a new one, Madam Speaker. They spent $4.5 billion on an existing pipeline to pay out Kinder Morgan shareholders because that was consistent with protecting the profits of their corporate friends. And here's a model, here again, where instead of allowing new media startups to be eligible for this funding, as we know, many of you know, a lot of people are interested in, in new media uh, startups. This is a program that favors the established print industry. It didn't have to be that way. That was a decision that the Liberals made. But once yep. again, coincidence that huh. benefits established corporate interests. 
over everybody else. And so there is definitely a pattern. Unfortunately, it's had an influence on this. They waited too long to, to present a real solution. Yep. So we're finding it hard to find agreement before the next election, and that's unfortunate if it causes Canadians to feel less trustful of their, of their journalism during an election, Madam yeah, Speaker. Any comments? Questions et commentaires? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary of the Government House Leader. Yes, so thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And uh, I really want to ask a question with the, the previous uh, speaker, but time didn't allow for it. And, you know, I think it's really important that the NDP get a better understanding of, of the situation when it comes to our culture and arts, where we have actually spent literally well over $2 billion, record amounts of investments in culture and arts. This government doesn't need to be lectured from the New Democrats on that issue when we have delivered such historical amounts of money. In regards to the media, uh, ma uh, Madam Speaker, this is not the first time in which we have responded to the changes that have been taking place within our media. We have spent uh, likely in the neighborhood of about $50 million since in terms of assisting. This tax credit program is going to go a long way uh, in providing uh, in many ways a survival, in other ways a complementing, allowing for other forms of compensation to potentially uh, take place in other sectors, uh, whether it's uh, private advertising or whatever else it might be. This is something I believe that is being well received. And some of the strongest advocates for it were, in fact, uh, union members. Would the member not agree that that's a good thing? The R.O. member for Elma Transcona. Well, what I think a good thing would be, Madam Speaker, would be to have a plan, first of all, that addresses the structural issues that are causing this uh, upheaval within, within the industry so that it's not just... Uh, you know, anywhere from a one-year to a five-year funding fix on a model that isn't working. And I've, and I've proposed some ways that they could address that structural deficit, Madam Speaker. And the second thing that I think would have been a good thing would have been that for them, instead of sitting on their hands for four years, would have been to present this plan much earlier in the Parliament so that there are opportunities to make changes and tweaks in light of criticism that was bound to come up to try and get closer to something that more people from more sides of the political spectrum could wholeheartedly endorse so that we find a way to ensure that Canada continues to have quality independent journalism, which is important for our democracy, and do it in a way that is as least politicized as possible because that's an inherent part of that project. Thank you. Questions and comments? Your Honour Member for Calgary Shepherd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To so the member, uh, I serve on the Finance Committee, and this, this bailout is embedded in an omnibus budget bill. I think it deserves mentioning again. It's something the government promised not to do. This is also the first, one of the, the it's a three kind of package uh, deal, and in it, it, it has a, a panel that is going to oversee a tax credit. So, for the, I, I, you know, I can't find any other tax credit the government has that has a government-appointed panel that decides on this. Typically, we let the Canada Revenue Agency decide who meets the eligibility criteria that's set in the law. So to the member, does he know of any other tax credit out there where the government basically uh, appoints a panel to decide who is in, who is out? Uh, if he has any one of them, I'd love to hear it. The R member for Elmwood Transcona. The short answer is no. I don't. And I want to thank the member for having brought up the fact that this is couched in an omnibus budget bill. This is a serious, I mean, whatever anybody thinks of it, whether they, whether they think this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, or whether they think this is a horrible end to Canadian democracy, or more likely, I think, somewhere in between, um, what people should be able to agree on is that it is, it is significant to have this amount of government funding available to media organizations. And it's the kind of thing that deserves a real debate. It's the kind of thing that a government that said, for instance, that they were going to put paid to the practice of omnibus budget bills, that criticized the previous government for making unilateral changes to the Elections Act, which they then subsequently did, that, that had said they wouldn't move forward with unilateral changes to the rules of Parliament, but then tried to do exactly that. This is another industry that touches on the very fundamentals of Canadian democracy, and we should have gotten a lot more of an effort by the government to bring people on all sides of the political spectrum on board to ensure that this was done in a way that... Yep people could expect, and instead they've taken the same ham-fisted approach that they've taken to changes in Parliament, to changes to the Elections Act, and to implementing their uh, budget bills. I, I note, you know, in that same budget bill, they're adopting the Conservatives' misguided approach to immigration. That itself deserves 
real and sustained uh, debate, and instead they're tucking it into the back of a budget bill. And there certainly isn't time to debate both those significant changes under the auspices of a single bill, let alone all the other content of the bill that we haven't touched on in today's debate.